Hello, and welcome to Portfolio Matters Weekly Update, Week 78. And it's been another dramatic week in both politics and the market. But before we get into it, Stuart will read the disclaimer. Everything discussed during the Portfolio Matters podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. Listeners should be aware that we will be discussing securities that we own or have a financial interest in. Please do your own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. A full disclaimer can be found at the end. Well, thank you, Stuart. Okay, the the news this week. Well, the head of the German Federation of Trade Unions has warned that entire industries in Germany could fail because of the lack of gas supply this winter as Russia cuts gas supplies to Europe. And we have a special section on the coming energy crisis in Europe. China is considering a $220 billion stimulus package to support infrastructure spending in H2. So China is going to double down on infrastructure-led investment to support the economy. And finally, It was a bad week in Clown Town, and Boris Johnson has resigned as head of the Conservative Party, but remains prime minister for now. Who knows what comes next? So it was also a very bad week for the euro and for sterling, both of which sold off. And this is Chinese local government bond issuance, and you'll see... The last couple of months, it has shot up. China is addicted to infrastructure spending, but you'll see when we go through this week's economic data, the Chinese economy seems to be recovering quite strongly from lockdowns. So moving on to this week's economic data. Well, Eurozone producer price inflation came down slightly from April in May and was below expectations, but still remains extraordinarily elevated at 36.3% year on year. So we had a load of service PMI data this week, having had the manufacturing PMIs last week. So in the EU, services slightly beat expectations coming in at 53, but that is well down on May. In May, it was 56.1. So the Eurozone economy is still growing, but it's slowing rapidly. Construction sector PMIs in the EU also missed expectations and came in at 47. So construction activity in the Eurozone is now contracting. And reminder, the construction sector leads the economy. We did a special podcast on this. The housing cycle is the business cycle. In the UK, services PMIs were actually surprisingly resilient and beat expectations and rose in June over May. So the UK economy is showing surprising resilience. Um, Construction sector PMIs in the UK missed expectations, falling to 52.6 in June from 56.4 in May. So that's quite a big drop, but it's still expanding. In the US, services PMIs beat expectations, came in at 52.7, which was down on May, but above expectations. Now, moving on to China, we had a load of PMIs, all of which were very positive, having beaten expectations. So the manufacturing PMIs came in at 51.7, above expectations. The services PMI massively beat expectations, came in at 54.5, against expectations of 49.1. And as a result, the composite came in at 55.3 compared to expectations of 50. So the Chinese economy seems to be bouncing back strongly from lockdowns. But 
you always tend to get a strong bounce back due to pent up demand. The question is, will that last? So moving on to some charts, Stuart. Right, well, this is the, the dramatic uh, uh, number that uh, Keith highlighted before the EU PPI year on year. I mean, it's just incredible, isn't it? But almost 40% um, year on year increases. So uh, no wonder uh, the German Federation of Businesses were saying that some industries were just um, you know, not gonna be viable if you've got this sort of change in your input costs, um, presumably any energy related industry is, is suffering massively. Uh, this is the EU services. So as with many of these data points, they're showing expansion because the number is above 50, but not as strong as previously. So there's the, the risk of, of stall speed of um, not being able to continue the expansion. But you know, technically for the moment, it's above 50, still expansion. And the composite showing exactly that sort of picture. Um, uh, the EU construction PMI, and um, that is, however, pretty clearly below 50. So uh, shrinkage there, I'm in a sense surprised it's not, uh, not even weaker. Uh, UK services, um, as Keith highlighted, not too bad at all, actually, sort of uh, mid 50s continuing uh, expansion. Uh, UK composite, therefore, you know, showing very much the, the same sort of picture. Some are cause for worry, because the numbers are coming down, but it hasn't fallen below 50. Uh, UK construction, um, again, th that same picture, still above 50, but coming off. Uh, the China manufacturing PMI showing that very, very strong rebound um, to, uh, to 52, a level it hasn't uh, breached since the bounce back from the initial COVID, uh, COVID restrictions. Uh, China services showing very much the same sort of picture. And obviously the composite being the aggregate of those previous two, showing that very strong bounce back. Uh, US services are uh, the classic picture above 50, but uh, reducing. And the, the composite, um, again, the same story. The Challenger Jobs Cuts data refers to planned job cuts by US employers. And you'll see that it is just starting to tick up. So something to watch. Uh, turning to US construction spending, we've seen the first month on month reduction in aggregate construction spending. Um, so again, indicating the same sort of pattern as we've seen around the world where services are doing okay, but uh, anything tangible, anything physical, um, beginning to suffer. Our US initial jobless claims are picking up. I mean, not huge, but definitely a reversal of the trend that was evident until Easter last year. Continuing jobless claims, again, beginning to pick up. Presumably jobless claims would be a very much a lagging indicator if we do go into recession. But for the moment, um, initial sign for concern, but, but not dramatic. And this is a, uh, the data on the US 30 year mortgage rate, which we've highlighted over the past few months, given that massive increase, almost basically a doubling from 3% to 6% in 30 year mortgages. It's come off a bit now, more like a 5.7% uh, 30 year mortgage rate. Uh, German trade surplus has collapsed and is now a deficit, which I think uh, will surprise many people. We're not used to uh, that from Germany, obviously, a result of the uh, the energy crisis that Europe is suffering. So in, in summary, uh, European services PMIs uh, show that the EU economy is still growing, but the, the growth is rapidly slowing. The construction sector, however, does appear to be in recession. For the UK, uh, not bad picture at all, actually, for UK services. Uh, growth is low, but is currently stable. US services, <clears throat> um, Again, the same picture of growth, but slowing growth and the jobs market perhaps showing some initial signs of, of peaking. And again, physical uh, manufacture, in this case, construction looking pretty weak. And the, the big news, I think, is really that, that massive bounce in the, the Chinese economic statistics. Obviously difficult to know if, it's, um, if it will persist, but for the moment, 
the easing of the lockdowns and possibly this infrastructure uh, spending boost um, may, uh, changing the, the, the picture in the Chinese economy. Thank you, Stuart. Okay, on to one chart. And this is the credit default swap on Credit Suisse. You see that it has surged to a level unseen since the great financial crisis. And reminder, we've talked about how rapidly rising interest rates are going to cause financial stress to highly geared and highly indebted entities, financial entities. And we don't know where those stresses are yet going to play out and who is going to fall into crisis. But the market is concerned about Credit Suisse and I'm expecting financial shocks in the coming months. We just don't know where they're gonna be yet. So be cautious. Keith, just, just to add something on that, um, I think most viewers and listeners will have heard of Terry Smith, um, who set up the very successful Fund Smith investment operation. Now, he used to be a financials analyst. And one thing I always remember him saying was he stopped doing that because he just couldn't get the information from the accounts that he previously could, uh, previously could do. And if you think of all the various web of interconnections uh, between all the different financial counterparties, Everyone is going to be having that same experience of, you know, you might be lending to Credit Suisse, but then you look through the accounts and you can't actually work out exactly what's going on. So you're inherently going to be cautious and you're going to back off. Yeah. And I think that that rise in suspicion and in worry can become a sort of uh, self-perpetuating um, syndrome. Actually, you, you raise a really good point there, Stuart, but also I've we are going to do a special section on the... Um, European energy crisis coming up. And one thing I haven't highlighted is the fact that that energy crisis and the stress it's going to cause to manufacturers and the business sector is obviously then going to feed through to financial stress because they've all got lots of debt and that will cause stress to the financial system, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, all very bad for the Eurozone and potentially the UK as well, who's energy markets are interlinked with Europe. So in summary, be cautious. We're expecting financial stress to get worse until something breaks. And on to Inflation Watch, where actually there's not too much, uh, too much news. Um, UK, um, we've already reported CPI of 9.1%, uh, US 8.6, Europe 8.6, Germany 7.6, and uh, Japan, 2.1%. And that, of course, is causing ructions in the Japanese economy and society. They've not experienced that rip-roaring inflation for many a year. Right, now, just look, having a quick look at the ECB's balance sheet, because quietly in the background, it has still been growing. They've not backed off yet from the, the asset purchases. Obviously, that is the plan. I think it's from this month, is that right, Keith? Well, yeah but clearly they're still buying. Mm. I'll believe it when I see it, <laughs> frankly. Mm. Uh, the BOE's balance sheet uh, took a step change down in March 22, but since then it's, it's pretty much flat, um, which I was slightly surprised that I thought the idea was to, uh, to allow the bonds to run off, but um, they're clearly still reinvesting and the balance sheet is, um, is remaining pretty stable. The Fed's balance sheet beginning to slowly roll over. They're, they're a bit more down the road of uh, QT, obviously taking it very tentatively when you're dealing with such massive uh, numbers and where it's not always the price of credit that's important, but the sheer liquidity and availability of money. Mm. So <clears throat> tiptoeing into QT by the Fed. One thing we've talked about previously is how, in theory, QT... QE should be completely reversible because what all you're doing is swapping cash on banks' balance sheets for bonds, and you should be able to swap that back. But the reality is, you know, you see the size of the Fed balance sheet it rises very quickly. 
but it's falling very slowly. QE is not really reversible because it's fine. You know, that amount of financial tightening would have severe effects. So, you know, the idea that QE was not inflationary rests on it being reversible. Well, the other thing which um, always has me confused is the, 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 the seeming sort of spaghetti of uh, repos and reverse repos and the hypothecation. Mm. It's very difficult to, to get a clear traditional sense of, of how much lending is happening, how much gearing really exists, what counterparty risks there really are. Mm. Uh, the BOJ's balance sheet is continuing to grow. It's the one central bank which is not uh, hinting at um, uh, QT or let alone raising uh, short-term interest rates. And <clears throat> given the, the issues in the Japanese bond market, i.e. people are very skeptical that they can hold the line, um, the BOJ is in a sort of war of money and it's got more yen than anyone else. So it's really a question of uh, how much longer they want to continue. Yeah. Uh, this is a chart showing the US uh, personal consumption expenditure inflation for services component. And we can see that's now reached basically 4.7%. So this is not just about um, energy and food. This is now broadening the inflation into services. Uh, now, it seems that the Fed rate hikes have successfully dampened inflation expectations uh, there, not just in Germany, as in the previous chart. We can see the five-year break-even expectation, uh, inflation expectations have fallen from a few months ago where it was about 3.5% to almost 2.5% now. And the global PMI indicators, um, th this is showing a, a, a bit of a, well, a very strong historic correlation, which has just recently broken down, where inventories and backlogs, which normally move in sync, uh, have not been doing so just recently, where inventories are uh, elevated. And this, uh, I think we've covered before in the, the bullwhip effect that that can have on production as people hoard and then find that they've got excess inventories and how that uh, normally relates to, to backlogs. But that appears to have broken down over the past year or so. Well, actually, Stuart, if you look back to 2001, we're going into the recession you'll see the same thing happened. So order backlogs were collapsing while inventories were still rising. And that may indicate that companies over-ordered, those original orders are being delivered, building inventories, and they're now cutting back hard on orders, leading to a drop in order backlogs. So oh, that yes. May, yeah, may that's indicate, a good way of reading the... Yeah. Yeah, and I think you can see that lead effect in uh, 09 10 as well, can't you, where it's backlogs leading inventories. Yeah. And now French inflation is forecast to rise in the coming, coming months, um, driven by services. And um, we can see uh, a bit of an effect in the red bar from, uh, from food, but it's really the orange bar services and, of course, energy that's um, leading to the, the big increase. I'm interested to see, however, that uh, this chart has also included the vitally important French uh, product of tobacco. That's a, a non-trivial contributor to French inflation historically. Mm. Well, we're seeing that in both the US and the Eurozone, that inflation is now spreading to services, which means it's broadening and becoming more persistent. Now, this is a chart that, that surprised me. Sulfuric acid prices are up 150% in 18 months. Uh, sulfuric acid is used as a key ingredient uh, in industrial production, essential for copper and uranium mining. Now, the thing that surprised me about this was the fact that it hasn't come off a lot, given what's happened mm. to industrial metals um, over the past month or so. Um, so I don't know whether there's, there's some issue with the frequency of the data, but um, yep. uh, it, it zoomed up, and, but, but not crashed. You're right. Most important commodity prices have come off, but... Um... Not sulfuric acid. Thank you to our Discord member, Rogue Trader, for sending us that. Okay, on to recession watch. So the two years versus 10 years has inverted again. And reminder, yield curve inversion is a very reliable indicator of 
future recessions, although it does so with a big lag. So the yield curve inversion is forecasting recession within the next two years, basically. And fears of recession have meant that the yield curve in the US has drifted down over the last few weeks. So the blue line is the yield curve on the 24th of June. The white line is on the 5th of July. And you'll see that yields have come down at the long end by quite a long way. In the EU, the market expectations for ECB rate hikes, which briefly went above 1%, have now fallen sharply. And the market is still expecting rate hikes this year, but is now expecting only 75 basis points. I think that's wrong. I think there's no way they're going to get to 75 basis points. And in the US, manufacturing job listings have collapsed and they've collapsed at a tremendous rate. So this is concerning for the US economy. And a reminder, the manufacturing and construction sectors are the only sectors of the economy which tend to shed jobs prior to recession. They're leading indicators. So this is potential leading indicator of a recession. But the number of job vacancies remain very high. So that would seem to indicate the jobs market in the US remains in rude health. This chart shows equity withdrawals. And we know that US house prices have risen by 21% in the last year. And that has allowed US consumers to withdraw equity from their houses to support consumption. And we also know the lenders are now stepping back from that market and increasing the price or, and availability of mortgage refinancing. So expect mortgage equity withdrawals to slow or go negative and that to reduce demand. We're talking about reduced demand. This is the fiscal impact in the US. And so the withdrawal of pandemic stimulus has actually led to negative fiscal um, expenditure growth. So that is detracting from US demand. And the Citigroup Economic Surprise Index remains negative this week. It's fallen further into negative territory. US goods expenditure is falling. It's gone negative. But service expenditure continues to expand. That may explain why we, we're seeing a drop in US manufacturing jobs, but not yet any downturn in the services sector. German consumer confidence continues to fall and is at an all-time low. And as we talked about previously, EU construction activity is now contracting. Corporate borrowing rates are at their highest in 10 years, and lots of borrowers are going to need to refinance in the coming months, years and they're going to have to do so at elevated rates. In addition, in addition, as the economy slows down and they suffer financial stress, they're likely to suffer ratings downgrades, which will push them into higher yield categories, exacerbating their borrowing um, costs. So this is the global credit impulse, which is the worst it's been, even worse than during the great financial crisis. And there is a correlation between the global credit impulse and earnings growth over the following year. And if that correlation still holds, then we're expecting negative earnings growth over the coming year. And higher mortgage rates, as we showed you earlier, 
lead to a drop in demand. Essentially, housing becomes less affordable. And we are now seeing some indications that the US housing market is cooling and home sales are falling. This is year on year home sales in the US down significantly. Thank you to our US viewer, Herman, for sending me this from the Calculated Risk blog. But employment in the US continues strong. As yet, there is no indication that of a slowdown in US employment leading to the SARM rule picking up. The SARM rule looks at changes in US employment as a predictor of recession. Now, generally, it is a contemporaneous or near contemporaneous indicator of recession. And Keith, that's why I think your previous chart was so interesting, looking at tech and engineering jobs, uh, the job yeah. adverts as a leading indicator of the leading indicator. Yeah. But while we're on employment, temporary workers are a very good leading indicator because they're the easiest ones to fire. And you'll see that prior to the last two recessions, there was a drop off in temporary worker employment. And so far, we have not seen that in the US. So that indicates the jobs market remains tight for now. And that this is something we'll be watching going forward. So in summary, the EU economy is not doing well and appears to be heading for an imminent recession. But the US economy is slowing, but it's still growing for now. And there are few signs of an imminent recession in this week's data. Services spending remains resilient, although the housing market is slowing. And that means the European economies are going to be worse than the US economy, and that is bad for the euro and sterling versus the dollar. Okay, now we have a special section on the coming energy crisis in Europe. Now, we have talked about this many times over the last few months, but this time I've really sat down and thought about the implications. So this is the electricity price for next year. So it's shot up in Germany, France, and Italy. And you'll see on the left-hand chart, the price for Germany. And this is from earlier in the week. This is from later in the week. You see it shot up well above 300 euros per megawatt in the last few days. We look at French forward electricity prices. This is a truly frightening chart. It's up almost ninefold in 18 months. How French and German industries will be able to cope with enormous increases in their energy costs, I don't know. And all that is due to Russia cutting off gas supplies to Europe. So this is gas supplies via the pipeline that goes through Ukraine to Slovakia. This is the pipeline that goes from uh, through Belarus to Poland and has now hit zero. And this is Nord Stream running at a third of capacity. So we look at that in total, you'll see that gas supplies to Europe are down two thirds since 2019. And European gas storage is now about 52% full as of mid-June. Although Europe has been building its gas stocks due to LNG imports, and actually they're above where they were last year, but the market is expecting reduced Russian gas flows from now on, leading to a winter fuel crisis in Europe. 
As a result, Dutch gas prices for the coming year are up 330%. And European electricity prices are elevated. And is not being helped by the French nuclear fleet being half closed for maintenance. So this is output from the uh, French nuclear power stations and you'll see it is at a low, lower than it's been in the last 15 years. So Blue, the Bundesbank are forecasting that if Germany has to resort to gas rationing, then in Q1 2023, you could see a shock to the German economy of eight and a half percent of GDP. Now, the great financial crisis, German GDP dropped by less than three percent. This is an abs would be absolutely enormous. And this is a chart we showed you earlier. As a result of the elevated energy costs, Germany's trade balance has totally collapsed and has gone negative. Thank you to Ali Broid for sending us this. And we look at the Eurozone as a whole, you see the same pattern. So this is structurally bad for the Euro. So the Euro used to be supported because it was a net exporter. Well, it ain't, it ain't, ain't anymore. It's a net importer. But it is going to take a while for Russia to create the infrastructure to divert its gas supplies towards Asia away from Europe. So currently, it can only export a fraction of its gas to Asia but it has plans so that by 2030, it could, would no longer need to export to Europe. German consumers this winter. So effects, well, bad for EU inflation, high and rising energy costs, bad for EU economic growth, bad for the EU balance of payments, incredibly bad for EU basic industry, some of which just simply won't be able to survive. So what are the implications? Well, the Eurozone will be suffering from high cost push inflation. The ECB can't print more gas, basically. So there's nothing the ECB can do to bring down cost push inflation. As a result, Eurozone economy is likely to slow and I doubt the ECB will be able to raise rates as much as it intends. That's even the 75 basis points currently being forecast by the market, I think is, is optimistic. So that's bad for EU real bond yields, bad for EU bonds in general, and bad for the euro. So the investment implications are to essentially avoid all eurozone assets, eurozone corporate bonds. It potentially, it could be good for eurozone government bonds relative to other eurozone assets as the eurozone goes into recession. Um, Stuart, what's your thoughts on that? Well, it's all very depressing, but it's difficult to see um, a way out, isn't it? It's like a, a whirlpool. Uh, you're being sucked into it. Um, the energy is just so fundamental to, to any economy, even a modern economy. And um, well, I, I, my understanding was a lot of basic industries in Europe were already suffering and were complaining years ago about uh, uncompetitive energy prices compared to um, uh, Asian uh, competitors. And now you've, you've had like a, um, an order of magnitude increase in, in energy costs. So it, it, it just seems to be, you know, they'll, they'll be eviscerated unless yeah. there's some direct, direct government support, which I suppose is, is reasonably likely um, you know, to protect, uh, protect jobs. You can imagine some social support program. 
Yeah, I mean, the, um, we covered earlier how the Eurozone economy is doing worse than the US. And I think you're already seeing the effect of high energy prices in the Eurozone affecting the economy, but it's going to get worse. And another knock-on effect is it will be bad for commodity demand as European basic industry essentially shuts down. So one line conclusion, avoid all euro denominated assets, essentially, and the UK energy markets are linked to European ones. And although the UK is in a slightly better position, it's not much better. So I'd also be cautious about sterling denominated assets. And on a related subject, as we head into what I think will be a big energy crisis and economic crisis in the Eurozone, I thought Stuart and I would discuss our memories of the great financial crisis. So reminder, this is a chart of the S&P over 2007, 8 and 9. And the bear market lasted 14 months, during which the S&P fell by over 50%. Our current bear market is less than six months old. Stuart, what are your memories? Well, um, first of all, that it was a very sort of slow moving train wreck, wasn't it? That um, there was a big warning by HSBC who bought one of these subprime vendors in the States and had made you know, big profits out of it for a couple of years. But then they actually realized that, hold, hold on, um, we, we've got a massive bad debt problem here. And that they had a massive write down and it didn't seem to affect markets. It didn't seem to be impacting uh, other similar investments uh, at the aggregate level or indeed you know, for individual banks. And I think it took about another six or seven months for there, for there to be a read across to the American banks, which, which had um, just the same sort of risks. So there was a very delayed realization by the market and also I have to say by me. And to some extent, I think I was sort of hostage to some efficient market theory, um, mm. thinking that, oh, well, you know, if the market hasn't responded and, and this is clearly public information, um, it, it sort of encouraged a certain passivity um, instead of being um, paying attention and engaging one's brain. The other thing in terms of one's brain that I've got to be honest about, I, I just really time and again came across areas where uh, I really had to face up to my own ignorance. You know, when Northern Rock uh, collapsed, I thought, well, hold on, you know, they've issued these mortgages. Uh, what's the delinquency rate? Why are they really suffering? Um, but of course, that wasn't really the issue. The issue was about whether they could get more short term financing. Yeah. Um, uh, I realized I didn't know really what a, a CLO was, was, was really how that really operated. And looking through, I did a fine tooth comb through my own portfolio. And um, I realized that there was something I was invested in when I hadn't really fully understood what, how it was structured from a, a capital point of view. And it was actually, there was a lot of debt in it. And I realized that I didn't know whether that was non-recourse debt. And I was suddenly thinking, oh my goodness, And if, if this thing goes under, am I not only going to lose 100%, but am I going to be uh, having to cough up for, for, this, wow. for this debt? Um, yeah, so that was a bit of a sort of stomach churner. Um, and fortunately, it was non-recourse debt, but I should have known, shouldn't I? Mm. Um, I was sort of too taken in by, you know, the headline term sheet of this, this offering, rather than thinking through, you know, genuinely disaster scenarios can and do happen. Uh, the other thing, of course, was interconnectedness. And we've, we've covered this in a couple of instances on, on the show today, but you don't know um, how different banks are connected to each other. You don't know how nervous they're going to be of their counterparties. Um, so you, you can get these sort of avalanche effects where you know, one snowflake here topples you know, a, um, a, a bunch of snow, which then snowballs and, and causes a huge avalanche. Mm. Um, in, you, you're asking about memories. Well, fear, <laughs> partly born of ignorance, 
um, were we going to have a 1930s depression? Um, and that fear uh, led me uh, to actually sell when markets bounced back a bit, because it took me so long to understand the full extent of the risks that there were out there. By the time I did, did realize the risks and the market was bouncing back, um, I actually sort of took money off the table and, and lost out from, from some of the, the, the rally. Actually, while we're on that subject, Stuart, I did the same. So ah. I've done a um, uh, podcast, My Worst Trade on Kazakh Miss, which was a tremendous trade. But I mean, I um, we're talking about my ignorance. I bought UK banks going in late 2008 in the belief that, you know, how bad could it get? We'd still need a banking system. And therefore, you know, the government would have to bail out the banks. What I failed to realize was, of course, they could nationalize them. So, you know, they did bail out the banks, but shareholders, i.e. me, got stuffed. And when we talk about the fear, I had bought, I was so confident that we were going to bounce back because we always do bounce back. And China had announced this enormous stimulus measures that I had bought a load of stock using CFDs. And we had, we as a family had a terrible, terrible time as Everything just kept falling. I had margin calls, had to increase the mortgage on the house to meet the margin calls. And essentially, these bets all came good. But by that stage, I was so sick of the whole thing. The moment they came into profit, I just closed all those CFDs. Whereas I should have just, you know, held on and I've made out like a bandit. But actually, you know, it had been such a stressful experience that I just wanted rid of them. And yeah. like, I kept hold of all my physical stock and that was great. But, you know, avoid leverage out there. Mm, absolutely. Well, I think that that's on the next slide, isn't it? I'm talking about some consequences and um, you know, what to do differently. Oh, the, the other you know, big thing from the, the GFC was, you know, I tend to think of myself as a, as a value investor, but value became completely irrelevant um, in, because you didn't quite know what you were buying. Um, and particularly in the case of banks, uh, you know, Lehman's kept saying yes, but uh, you know our, our book value is X, Y, Z, and you know we're, we're clearly massively underpriced and blah blah blah. But of course, no one believed the book value. Though, in retrospect, after the Lehman's was worked out, they did. There was something left. Equity holders hmm. did get a, a small amount that they were, in that sense, solvent, but they weren't liquid. And yeah. that that's the issue, isn't it? Particularly with banks, they're very highly leveraged. They need short-term financing for long-term assets. And uh, as we all know, the market can remain irrational longer than you can remain solvent. Mm. Um, so it's just, just picking up on, on your point about your CFD bet and you know, having to sort of take out uh, some more equity from your house. One consequence of the GFC for me is to set aside you know, an amount of cash which just never gets invested. I mean, it's, it's best back to classic um, uh, financial planning, but have, you know, whether it's two years, three years cash on hand so that you're never a forced seller and you, you know you can cover lifestyle expenses. Um, and as, as you just said, you know, be, be leery of debt. Um, it's, it can work when I, when I was thinking about that, that non-recourse debt and was it recourse? I mean, that, that was a real stomach churner. Um, yeah. But obviously that, that's from a personal point of view, but, um, for highly geared companies, um, that that's your equity can be you know, wiped out um, very very quickly. Yeah. So my memories, well, like Stuart, my chief memory is just how long it took to play out. Is the um, HSBC warned about subprime in two thousand and six, and then the market continued to rally in two thousand and seven, and then. Late in 2008, we got the big sell-off. And it's, um, I, so I have this view of equity markets as being like your thick cousin. It takes a long time for them to work out what's going on. They just want to remain optimistic. And so don't get suckered into thinking because the market is not reacting, that it, everything's fine and it won't react. 
actually it's just a bit thick. The other thing I'd say is that um, never try and bottom fish financial companies. You've just got no idea what's in them. And this is onto Stuart's point about the opacity of uh, financial companies these days. There's the whole financial system is so interlinked and opaque and they all have a huge incentive to try and pretend that everything is okay until they can't. And so the first thing you know that there are problems is when they can no longer pretend there aren't problems. And then you go straight into crisis. Stuart, do you want to do this? Implications, what are your final thoughts? Well, um, be cautious that just the fact that the, the S&P, for instance, has fallen 20, 25% does not mean that it cannot fall a lot further. It has done um, in terms of further, in terms of percentages, but also in terms of duration. Um, thus far, we haven't seen the signs of strain in the financial sector that we had previously. Perhaps that's to do with the stress tests and, and the higher capital requirements, but it seems unlikely that the that that will also apply to all the, the shadow banks and the, the hedge funds and other disguised leverage opportunities that have been promoted to people. It may be that the, the standard commercial banks are safer, but mm. there's, there's always leverage out there um, in financial companies, and that's where a crack will come. Yeah, I agree. I think commercial banks in general are in much better shape than were in before the great financial crisis, largely because they haven't been lending for the last 15 years, frankly. But there's still lots of leverage out there. In particular, corporates have leveraged themselves up hugely, particularly during the pandemic. And now that interest rates are rising, if they have to then refinance, they could find themselves in stress, which in turn will put further stresses on the financial system. Right, now we have a special section on the Italian economy. Um, we've been highlighting over the past month or so the issues with the Eurozone and pointing to um, Italy as a source of risk to the, to the Euro. Um, Keith has put together a very interesting pack here, actually examining more fundamentally the situation of the Italian economy. And it's not quite what you might think. So uh, the chart here, shows that Italy lives within its means. It is actually a net exporter and has been pretty consistently since 2012, running you know, a trade surplus of about two to 3% of GDP. So we shouldn't <clears throat> be trapped by old memories of Italy um, having, its, uh, having a trade deficit, which were only really true from about 2005 to 2011. So Italy is a successful exporter. Now looking at uh, one, aspect of the debt issue that we always associate with Italy. Well, this is Italian private sector debt. And really, it's no worse than Germany's, and it's better than the US or the UK. So private sector debt here, more like about 170% of GDP, which is almost identical uh, to Germany and Austria. Now, prior to the pandemic, uh, Italy actually run, ran a primary budget surplus. So yes, the uh, public debt is large, but actually Italy was, um, in a sense, paddling its canoe successfully against the tide. It had a primary budget surplus. It wasn't adding to the debt stock beyond the debt that was necessary to pay the interest on the stock of debt. But it did look for quite a few years as if Italy's debt um, was going to be serviceable. Uh, the primary budget surplus was about 2% of GDP, which is something I don't think the UK has had in a long, long time. Now, the, the issue clearly is public sector debt, and that, that is very high, but it's a legacy of poor policies in the decades before 1995. We can see here in the blue line, the public sector debt to GDP ratio, which you know, until about 1970, was very modest, uh, post-war that is, um, at under 40% of GDP. But then it went up remorselessly until 1995, where it reached 120% of GDP, before it started to, to fall again. So there was um, successful efforts to rein in uh, the debt. But of course, um, just recently, all the pandemic-related expenditure has led to another big increase in public sector debt, 
uh, jumping to almost 160% of GDP. But just, just to stress again, there was a, um, a primary surplus, that, that is a budget surplus excluding debt interest. It's the debt interest that's the problem. Now, looking at the structure of the Italian economy, again, th this was rather a surprise to me. Um, it's no surprise that Germany is, uh, uh, makes 29% of the value of industrial production within the EU. But next, it, it's not France, it next is Italy. Italy is at 18% and France at 12%. So it's a pretty, um, uh, pretty clear the silver medal for Italy uh, on industrial production. Now this next chart very much surprised me that um, since 2015, Italian industrial production has increased by 10%, whereas German industrial production has fallen by 5.6%. So Italy, Italy's industrial economy is actually being uh, successful. But Italy has seen declining labor market productivity. This is a very interesting stroke worrying uh, chart showing Italian, I believe, unit labor costs um, relative to France or relative to Germany. And it's a pretty remorseless uptrend. That's the issue. Another way of looking at this is total factor productivity. And we can see that since uh, I think that's 1990, there's been a steady um, decline in total factor productivity. And that's since Italy joined the Eurozone and hasn't been able to, of course, uh, um, depreciate its way to competitiveness. Italian inflation is actually no worse than the average EU inflation rate. It's looking very, very similar uh, these days um, after having been you know, perhaps 1%, steadily about 1% higher until about 2012. Now turning to the, the private sector, um, the median Italian has actually got more wealth than the median European. So if we look at the, the, the um, orange bars here, this looks at the, the median wealth in Italy, in the Eurozone, in Germany, and in Austria. And you can actually see that, um, there, that the numbers in Italy are quite encouraging from a sort of social harmony point of view. But if you look at the average uh, the, uh, rather than the median, then the picture is, is rather different, uh, where Italy, Italy private wealth is a little lower than the Eurozone average, and quite a bit lower than, than Germany and Austria. But the fact that the there's a big difference in these bars, uh, the median versus the average in, for instance, Germany and Austria, indicates um, uh, a, a high dispersion of, of wealth within the country, whereas Italy is in the, being rather closer, um, the median to the mean, it, it, it does actually rather indicate that there's less dispersion of wealth and possibly therefore less social tension. So in conclusion, Many of the popular prejudices about Italy are wrong. It's a net exporter. It's actually fiscally quite responsible these days. That primary surplus is, is the key measure. It is actually competitive in the sense of in making sales. Its industrial production has grown more than Germany. And it is, it's no longer having a higher inflation rate than the Eurozone average. The problem is that historic stock of debt and the problem of productivity. So Italy remains incredibly vulnerable. It needs a period of time to let the primary surpluses uh, persuade markets and to wear down the debt. Uh, meantime, it's completely vulnerable to changes in bond market sentiment. Absolutely. And also, the Eurozone goes into recession. It's not going to have a chance to fix its finances because the um, tax revenues will collapse, the um, budget will collapse with it and fall heavily into deficit. And so um, you'll need to issue more debt. And the question is whether the ECB will be buying that debt to um, prevent fragmentation, fragmentation, as it says, or whether the bond market will be spooked and uh, Italian bond spreads will blow out, causing a crisis. Okay, on to other charts. So this is liquidity in the bond market, and it is awful. So if you want to sell bonds, you're going to move the price. And I take this to be a proxy 
for liquidity in all markets and liquidity is terrible. So that will exacerbate volatility. Now, it's not just uh, the US, Canada, etc., that's had a housing bubble. It's also Germany and mortgage interest rates in the Eurozone are rising quickly. Are German house prices and Eurozone house prices also going to face a correction? And finally, it took 215 years for the US to issue $7 trillion worth of debt. It has now issued $7 trillion since March 2020, so two and a bit years. The US budget deficit is just unsustainable. And on to the checklist, Stuart. Right. Well, a um, bit of a bounce back week in, in many assets, many risk assets. Uh, fuel share up 0.4% for the week, uh, which has reduced its decline for the year to just 6%. Uh, Stocks Europe up 1.7% for the week, meaning it's now down just 15% for the year. S&P 500 up 2% for the week. The Nasdaq are a bit more geared exposure up 4.4% on the week, though still down 26% for the year. The Hang Seng um, uh, Hong Kong index down um, about 1% for the week. Topics uh, for Japan up 2.3% for the week. The big mover of the week was Bitcoin, which has bounced um, at 15% on the week, now trading at about $21,800. Uh, the pound has been weak, as we've been highlighting, uh, given the, the, uh, the growth outlook uh, in the UK down another 1% for the week, and that makes an 11% decline for the year, which in currency land um, is, is a very big move. The dollar uh, index up 2.2% on the week, year to date up 12%. So some very big moves um, in relative prices there. Now, if we try to look at the decline in assets um, that we've experienced this year and measure it in, in real dollars, oh, sorry, not in real dollars, in, in nominal dollars. Um, the 2008 uh, crash produced a, a loss in wealth of about 7 trillion. This year, it's over 30 trillion. It's a massive wealth loss. Now, how much that, that affects spending is, is open to debate, depending on who owns the assets, but everyone has to be feeling poorer. And another way of looking at uh, the poor performance so far, uh, the, the chart here showing that um, stocks are down over 20% in the first six months of this year, which is the, the worst number since I think about 1970. However, um, let's, uh, let's consult the experts. Let's ask uh, stockbrokers analysts what they think is going to happen as the S&P 500 over the remainder of the year. Amazingly, they all think the market will rise. Um, uh, honourable um, mentions should, though, go to Cantor Fitzgerald and Morgan Stanley for predicting just a very small increase. Uh, the other end of the scale, we've got Credit Suisse, UBS and JP Morgan that all think the S&P 500 is going to be up a near 30% in the second half of the year. Um, turning now to the expectations for inflation. Um, We've had a bit of a whipsaw a couple of weeks ago that the whole fear was um, uh, that we were going to have stagflation. Now, the inflation part of that is beginning to be questioned. And um, <clears throat> one way of looking at that was the sensitivity of the performance of inflation proxy stocks uh, divided by the, uh, the overall market. And inflation proxies have come off by about 10% in relative performance as people are getting less worried uh, about the persistence of inflation and looking for fewer uh, safe havens. I don't know the exact composition of the inflation proxy index, but I suspect there's quite a few energy stocks in there who've uh, suffered quite a bit um, alongside other commodity stocks. Now, looking at the all important question of what earnings are going to be, as Keith was pointing out, if we're gonna get an earnings decline, we're gonna get a market decline. This is the evolution of Q2, Q2 and Q3 earnings forecasts. Um, now, the, 
This is broken down in black to the Q2 performance of earnings with and without the oil and gas and material sectors. The overall market doesn't look too bad at all. There's been some reduction in earnings forecasts, particularly around Easter, but since then they've been reasonably flat overall. But if you exclude the oil and gas and um, commodity stocks, then there's been a much more material a reduction in earnings forecasts down about 6%. Um, there's been a similar uh, reduction in earnings forecasts for, for Q3. Yeah, you notice though that Q3 numbers are still, you know, 2% above Q2 numbers. So market's still expecting decent growth in Q3. And the performance of the, the overall stock market is very clearly correlated with the change in, uh, in profits or earnings, depending on how you measure it all. So if um, profits are going to fall, then um, the price of the market is going to fall. It's not going to, the market isn't going to be making some rational level-headed uh, analysis of the average level of earnings uh, discounted at the appropriate rate. It's going to be rather more emotional and psychological than that. Now, here's an interesting chart looking at the, uh, the, the cumulative flows into equity funds and into bond funds. And there's a very clear divergence here where uh, bond funds have suffered redemptions, equity funds have not. And I think it's been uh, quite well publicized that the ARC Innovation ETF is still taking on, um, uh, taking on inflows despite its terrible performance. So in conclusion, Analysts remain very optimistic about corporate earnings and investors remain rather too long of equity markets. Thanks, Stuart. On to commodities. Well, this is from Bank of America and their Global Fund Managers Survey, and it's showing that fund managers remain very long of oil and commodities as of June. Now, that may well explain why there's been this big sell-off in oil and commodities. They were too long, it was a crowded trade, and as soon as some people rushed for the exit, they swamped low liquidity. But to my mind, the speed with which commodities have sold off just seems too fast. The fundamentals have not changed that much in the last few weeks. And so I think that we're likely to see a bounce. It seems overdone to me. And on that note, on to energy commodities. So generally a poor week for oil. Um, Brent was down to 105, down 6% on the week. WTI is down 5%. Dutch natural gas futures, however, up 20% on the week to an up 152% year to date. That is the European energy crisis. US natural gas futures bounced back, up 8% on the week, up 65% on the year. Coal continued its grind higher, up 6% on the week, 142% year to date. Uranium fell down 5%, up only 11% on the week. Now, the EIA got its act together and published some numbers this week. So I'm reporting the changes versus three weeks ago, which is the last data point we had. So this week, Total US crude inventories were 1.677 million, and that was down 4.4 million over the last three weeks. But private sector inventories rose by 15.2 million barrels over the last three weeks. So, what that is showing is that. SPR releases have been more than enough to supply private inventories and private demand. But overall, the US is still consuming more oil than it produces. And in total inventories have been falling. 
U.S. oil production ticked up to 12.1 million barrels, which is only up 300,000 barrels year to date, which is disappointing. And the Baker Hughes rig count was unchanged. Now, if you're interested, pause, take a look. Who's buying fossil fuels from Russia? Well, not necessarily who you might think. Germany is number two. It's the number two customer after China. And actually, it's only slightly behind China. India, who I thought was the big um, buyer over the period between February and June this year, is only the eighth largest buyer. Europe dominates. So this is crude, come up quite sharply. We had a little bounce back in the last half of the week. And Bernstein are forecasting that in a recession, oil would fall to $80. And if um, GDP growth fell to zero in around the world, it could fall back to around $45. So recession downside for oil. And this is US inventories. And you notice total inventories down here appear to be leveling out. They've stopped falling. We are seeing demand destruction as we discussed last week. These are Dutch natural gas futures, and this is a nasty chart. It is grinding higher. This is not the spike we saw earlier in the year. This is grinding higher as the markets become very concerned about winter gas supplies. This is US natural gas. It's bounced back a bit from its recent sell-off. Coal has resumed its grind higher. There's absolutely astonishing returns on the year. Reminder. Despite all the climate change rhetoric, the world is going to be burning more coal over the coming years. This is change in coal production over the coming, over the period 2021 to 2024. And you'll see that India is going to burn an extra 162 megatons, China 57. It's uranium, which seems to be fairly stable. Stuart. Right, let's have a quick run through of industrial commodities. Uh, aluminium, a uh, little change on the week, down 0.6%, uh, off now 13% for the year. Uh, cobalt had a bad week, down 7.6% for the week, 14% for the year. Copper, uh, Dr. Copper, as we've been highlighting in previous uh, episodes, down another 3% on the week, uh, making a fall of over 20% for the year. Chromium are unchanged on the week. Iron ore also continuing to come off uh, 3% for the week. Lithium carbonate flat on the week, up 70% uh, for the year though. Neodymium oxide, again, flat on the week, uh, up 6% for the year. Nickel, minus 1.4% uh, for the week, uh, making year to date a uh, change of up 2.8%. Tin continuing to have a tough time, off 7% for the week, 36% for the year. Ferrovanadium are unchanged and zinc up about 3%. Uh, looking at this in, in the charts, you, you can see aluminium continuing to, to, to weaken um, from $3,750 a ton down to about 2,500. Cobalt, <clears throat> pretty, uh, pretty weak, has clearly suffered a, a step change down in price. Uh, copper, uh, that, that I think is the, is the scary one, um, given copper's uh, use in so many industrial um, processes, for that to have fallen so fast and so far, I think it is a, a real worry, a real flag of um, recession risk. Who knows what the Chinese stimulus program may do, perhaps that'll push it back up again. Yeah, but we saw earlier in the uh, Chinese PMIs that the Chinese manufacturing PMIs have bounced back strongly. If that is reflected in the copper price, then what that's saying is that um, the strength of the Chinese economy is not enough to ex um, offset slowdowns elsewhere. Uh, well, as we've just been highlighting, Dr. Copper is highly correlated to global uh, PMIs. We can see a very strong relationship here. Uh, going back to 2018. Um, so that would indicate that there's uh, more to come, more pain to come. 
uh, chart of chromium uh, flat over the past um, few months. Iron ore continuing to look rather sick, um, coming off from about $150 a ton um, a few months ago to more like 115 now. Lithium, uh, very flat, uh, hasn't changed very much since March. Neodymium, uh, again, flat uh, over the past couple of months. Nickel, now this, um, I don't know if people have time to, to read various uh, newsletters, but Matt Klein has written an excellent uh, piece on what was happening in the London Metal Exchange and the pressure that was brought to bear to unwind the the trades that, that have been done during the spike um, earlier in March. Dig it out if you've got the time. It's a fascinating and insightful review of the pressures that were, that were brought to bear. To, <clears throat> and I suppose the bottom line is back to the old Maine's quote, the John Maynard Keynes quote. You know, if you owe your bank a hundred pounds, you've got a problem. If you owe your bank a uh, million pounds, uh, your bank has got a problem. And that was essentially the issue um, uh, in unwinding these nickel trades. Tin continuing at the weak performance it's had ever since the spring, now down to about uh, $24,700 a ton. Ferrovanadium, um, after its spike earlier in the year, is uh, quietened down and it's been rather flat recently. Uh, zinc, uh, again, a very weak picture, bounced just recently, but uh, it's been a good poster child of the problems in industrial metals um, in, the second, or in the second quarter of this year. Uh, turning now to, to precious metals, another disappointing week for gold of 3.7% in dollar terms, um, now making a decline for the year of about 5%. Silver continuing to be weak, 3% uh, on the week, uh, now 17% off for the year, offering no protection whatsoever. Uh, platinum uh, one, off 1% 1 for the week, now about 9% weaker on the year. Rhodium 2.5%. Uh, fall on the week. Palladium showing a, a slight counter trend up 1.7% for the week, uh, meaning <clears throat> it's year to date gain of, <clears throat> of 5%. Here's the gold chart. Uh, I think we've discussed how disappointing gold has been as, a, as an asset allocation hedge. And yes, it's priced in dollars. So for a pound investor, you, you've probably covered yourself, but uh, it really hasn't shown the, the properties that we were all hoping for. Yeah. So back in March, it looked like it was going to really benefit from the surge in inflation. But since then, it's fallen 15 percent. Um, now we have a chart showing the purchasing power of one hundred dollars since year two, 2000. Now, it's a great chart uh, showing purchasing power has fallen um, uh, by about 40 percent since the year 2000. I'm slightly sceptical because I'm not sure this perfectly also includes the fact that um, you, know, you will be earning some interest on your, your, your dollars uh, mm -hmm. in the way you wouldn't be on gold. So I think it's more fair to, to compare the nominal gold price with uh, a, ca a cash yield on, on, your, on your cash mm -hmm. um, to see what you would really be earning. Yeah, but still. It shows that, you know, you want to just, if you're not getting any interest, then you're just looking at the value of holding, you know, pounds underneath your bed, or sorry, dollars underneath your bed, then their value steadily decays. If you're going to hold um, cash for any long period of time, don't. Put it in um, gold. Uh, the silver chart, uh, just as disappointing, if not more so than the gold, after you know, peaking at... Uh, thousand of one hundred and fifty dollars per troy ounce it's now under nine hundred uh, platinum uh, similar sort of story rhodium um, again i'm rather different uses for, for rhodium compared to, to gold and uh, and silver but still it's, it's not offered at any particular place to hide uh, palladium has been a bit stronger over the past month uh, now up to about uh, $2,000 uh, an ounce. Hey, thank you, Stuart. On to rates. And having fallen last week as the markets became confident that inflation's peaked, well, 
the markets sold off a bit. So bond yields rose across the curve in the UK and not by small amounts. So the two year rose by 15 basis points and the 50 year by 12 basis points. So the market is rowing back on some of its confidence that inflation has peaked. In the Eurozone periphery, yields also rose on the week, but only a small amount. So look at some charts. This is the Italian 10 year. It's stopped falling. Whether it starts rising again is another matter. We, are, we await the ECB's anti-fragmentation plan. UK 10 year, US 10 year. So off its lows. And reminder, the S&P seasonality chart, we're in the volatile summer months before the bad <laughs> October, September, October months. Okay, so concluding comments. It looks like the EU economy is slowing rapidly as energy prices are very elevated and you'll see that there's various unrest around Europe, particularly among the Dutch farmers currently. And as the energy crisis starts to bite, you could well see further unrest. The US economy is slowing slowly, but it's still growing. The UK economy is showing actually surprising resilience and the PMIs rose last month. And we've had a strong sell-off in commodities, which in the short term, to me, looks overdone. Stuart, what were you up to this week? Uh, well, I was mainly traveling, so I've got very little to report in terms of portfolio activity. But I did want to just take this opportunity to pick up on venture capital trusts, which is something I've covered on, on the show in the past. Um, they tend to get a lot of uh, attention around January, February time, uh, just in the run up to the end of the, the UK tax year. And just to, to recap, they are funds, professionally managed funds that invest in, in startups. Um, they give you big, big tax advantages. And um, what I highlighted earlier in the year was that there had been a massive increase in the amount of money that they were raising. Uh, now, I was a bit bit of that. I was taking part. I've got a you know, fairly st a steady program of each year buying some venture capital trusts. But that big rise in the amount of money that they were raising did make me wonder and worry that this was a classic capital cycle story where um, good returns lead to raising too much money, which destroyed the good returns. Now, it's only halfway through the year, but um, quite a few of the venture capital trusts that have reported recently have indeed reported poor subsequent returns. Um, to some extent, they're investing in small techie startups. So mm. they're, they're experiencing the, the tech downdraft that the, the NASDAQ encapsulates. But it's also, it, it is a reminder, don't chase performance. Um, I, I hope I'm doing something sensible with you know, every year, just taking part in, in a fairly steady program and I'm sort of averaging um, via that sort of approach. But I think there are going to be a lot of people who, in effect, have bought at the peak um, with some of the big capital raisings from the venture capital trusts. Yeah, and you did that uh, great podcast a while ago of uh, aggregating uh, your performance on various VCTs and EISs. And it'd be great if you could um, update us at some stage, Stuart. For my own part, I invested in some VCTs and EISs to offset some tax five years ago. And the performance has been really very poor. And frankly, you get this 30% um, tax break, but you know, I have given up. I mean, I think you're better at choosing these VCTs than I am. And um, I frankly prefer to take, pay the tax and try and uh, rate, uh, grow the capital myself. Okay, my performance. Well, I'm afraid I had a poor week. I was down 1%, um, underperforming the all share, which is up 0.4%, but I've had a good year. Now, as flagged last week, I decided to sell Petro Matad, which had um, 
has been a constant source of disappointment. And frankly, I've just lost confidence in management. The latest RNS where they reported having difficulties in accessing block 20 was the final straw for me. I think they're going to need to raise money and that's going to send the share price down further. So I've exited my position with a big loss. And I'm reminded of the chart we showed a few weeks ago showing the performance of the AIM oil and gas sector compared to oil and gas companies on the main market. And these small specky stocks, they don't have a great track record. When they work, you can get very good returns, such as Southern Energy Corp. When they don't, it's bad. So this is my asset allocation on Monday when I came back from a week's hiking in Corsica. And so the start of the week, I had about 8% in equities, bonds, which are was then entirely in the US Treasury 1 to 3. So essentially, it's a cash proxy of moving half of my cash out of sterling. And I had 44% cash in sterling. Now, during the week, I prepared that section on the e coming EU energy crisis. And as you'll know, I like to take a macro view and then allocate my cash accordingly. And I decided that the coming energy crisis in Europe is going to affect both Europe and the UK, and I should get my, all my cash out of sterling. So during the week, I did quite a lot of trading. I bought, I essentially moved all my cash out of sterling into US dollars. So I bought more of IBTS, which is US Treasury one to three year ETF, which is incredibly liquid. And that is essentially a US cash proxy. I can't hold US dollars. So this is an alternative. But I also bought a risk position. I started buying IBTL, which is the iShares US Treasury 20 year bond ETF. Now, my timing, as always, was pretty terrible. I bought it at 364 and it's promptly sold off by 3% down to 352. But I just can't see any way that the US avoids recession because I think the Eurozone goes into recession and the business cycle is the housing cycle and very high house prices in the US. Bear in mind the S&P Schiller, Case Schiller house price index in the US has risen 20% on the year. And then mortgage rates have doubled. I just can't see how the US housing sector can't slow down and slow down the US economy with it. So I think you see a recession in possibly H2, but certainly in 2023, then interest rates peak. And that should be good for the long bond. So I've started buying the long bond. Now, this bond, this instrument is much safer than the UK 2071 gilt because it has a duration, I believe, of something like 20 years, as opposed to 50 years for the UK 2071 gilt. So I have, I'm happy taking more risk in this. Now, if we look at my trade in the UK 2071 gilt, I have not added to it. I'm very concerned about the fiscal sustainability of the UK as we go into what I think will be another recession. We'll have to um, issue a load of bonds. I noted that the new uh, finance minister in the UK Nadim Zadari, his number one priority was cutting corporate tax rates. When we run a huge budget deficit and we're about to go into recession, not good for fiscal sustainability and gilt issuance. So you could see gilt sell selling off. And in a recession, 
safe havens are what the market decides they are. If I see gilt yields start to fall, I'll consider buying them, but not until that point. So I'm currently watching and waiting. And that's it. Thank you all for watching and making it through to the end. Please can you press like and subscribe to the channel. And in the meantime, it's goodbye from Stuart Owen. And it's goodbye from Keith Jordan. Goodbye. Goodbye. Full disclaimer, the material and information contained in this podcast is for information and entertainment purposes only and should not be relied upon for making a business, legal or any other decision. We may own or have a financial interest in any securities mentioned. Listeners should conduct their own research or consult a professional investment advisor before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned on the show. Whilst we endeavour to ensure that the information presented on the show is correct, we make no representations or warranties of any kind, expressed or implied, with respect to the podcast and website or to any information, products, services or related graphics discussed or presented in the podcast or website. Any reliance you place on such material is strictly at your own risk. You are solely responsible for the investment decisions you make. We will not be responsible for any errors or omissions in the podcast or website, including in articles or postings, for hyperlinks embedded in messages or for any results obtained from the use of such information. Nor will we be liable for any loss or damage, including consequential damages, if any, caused by a reader's reliance on any information provided by the podcast or website. Please do not listen to the podcast if you do not accept self-responsibility for your actions.